I wanted to do a, a recap of kind of like some of the main points of that, you know, that big jump from the from the tens to the eleven. So um, the system requirements, and we'll kind of brush over this uh, fairly quickly, but. We do have um, a operating system retirement or that is not supported anymore. Um, you can see that we have that for 2012 R2 and 2012 standard are no longer supported in the 11s. Um, here, uh, 11 ones uh, operating system requirements are, are very similar, um, just that the, the latest update or service pack tested is, is from February, 2023. Um, we do have a little bit of a change. I don't know if we have any Linux users. I myself am not a Linux user, but um, we did have uh, the Red Hat did go away um, here. Oracle Linux. This is a little confusing to me because it says the latest update was update five and eleven, but then it has update four, and that could have been a typo. Um, but it does look like two uh, two additions here with the Ubuntu Server twenty twenty two oh four LTS and Rocky Linux eight. All right, so just uh, from the 10s to 11s, the upgrade. So um, no ArcMap runtime available for those of you going from 10.9.1 to 11.1. Uh, um, but they, we do have some faster install times. Um, this portal upgrade status, very handy for those of us that were just sitting there waiting for uh, something to happen, but we didn't know what stage it was in. Um, I do really enjoy that. We do have our badges for retired items. So there, there are apps retired, um, many apps uh, and some classic dashboards retired at this version. So we'll just do some notable changes here. So end of support for the arc map based workflow. So again, 10.9.1 is the last version where you can have those runtimes um, operating together and where you can have some of those uh, configurable apps as well. Um, we have uh, hierarchical categories for organizing members. Um, we can schedule the admin reports to run automatically. Um, there's a nice uh, scan for portal for the operational health issues. Um, I did just run into this bug recently. So I had done a number of 11.1 deployments and I was getting mixed results when I ran that. So I, I do a lot of the operational health checks myself, but it's nice to have that report that just checks, checks down the list for you, prints something out that you can look at. Um, but I did find that it was only working half the time and Finally, uh, with Azure support, realized that there is a very strange bug that is fixed in 11.2. 11.2, by the way, is slated to come out this month. Um, we, we aren't sure if that's, you know, going to actually happen because sometimes those things get delayed, but that is uh, that was like the latest word from Esri. Uh, so this bug is fixed in 11.2, but what it is is that if you have um, a enterprise geo database that is registered with the ArcGIS server and it is named before ArcGIS data store, so you're in your, you're in your uh, uh, data stores and you see yours something like administrative boundaries or address points database, anything that would come before that, your operational health script isn't gonna work. So if you've tried to run that and you're like, I don't know why it's not working, that is why that is fixed in 11.2. Um, so we have uh, map viewer editing forms. We can create hosted feature layer views with predefined view definitions. Um, control the display of overlapping features with feature display order. We have that duplicate button for map viewer layers. Um, some new privileges we can uh, reassign and receive content. And then there's some additional privileges in 11.1 that we'll go over. Um, so this was a big one, the conditional visibility and calculated expressions. So, uh, and, and if you're working in the ArcGIS online environment, you may notice some of these capabilities. And then as you upgrade to new versions of enterprise, you'll start to receive those. So these may not be new capabilities to you, but this would be new to the 11 uh, versions. And then we have some retired apps. Uh, Oops, missed this one. So dashboard, there's the table element. And then this uh, feature, which is nice, render only when filtered option. So that, you know, you could have a nice message displayed there and it will only, it, it'll, you know, say like no data available or whatever and just it, just render that when when it's uh, um, filtered. So 
uh, retired apps. There is a Python script available. I have links at the end of this uh, that links to where this Python script is, but it's it's there's a number of configurable apps that are depreciated. And this Python script just makes it a lot easier to identify which items you may need to uh, essentially recreate before you move to the 11s. All right, so on to 11.1. So this is just a brief technical support. So um, the availability, so you have a general availability for everything from creating a case to so software hotfixes to new environment certif certifications um, from 2023 to 2025. You can see what's available in the extended. This is an extended release, so um, not sure if I mentioned this in the last webinar, but before, you know, Esri has its uh, short-term releases and its extended releases. And that was um, in the tens, that would have been 10.8, for example, would have been a short-term release. 10.8.1 would have been extended support release. So the way that that's working it, with the 11s uh, currently is that 11, the, it's odd even. So evens are the short-term uh, support releases and the odds are the extended support. So 11.0 is a short-term release. 11.1 is the extended support release. So you can see uh, the mature um, creating a case, phone chat, and then when it's retired for online support resources. So this is just kind of, I wanted to highlight some of the things that are retiring, and especially since we have some people that are on, you know, some some of the lower versions. Uh, it didn't look like we had anybody on, on 10.6. Um, that is coming up. So everything in red is is already retired. So um, again, these, the you'll see that I'm, I, I labeled something in 10.7, but that's because it's the short-term support. So it doesn't, you know, the, the support for that uh, doesn't last as long. So uh, 10.5.1, that is officially retired. 10.5, 10.7, 10.8, um, the ones are still good. And then 10.6.1 is actually retiring uh, soon as well. So for anybody that's watching this later on that might be at that version, it is time to upgrade. So we'll just take a look at uh, the system requirements for the database. So I'm just going to cover the the most common ones that that our clients work with for SQL Server. Um, this is 11 and zero. So if if you you know we're on the last webinar at 11, there hasn't been any changes. So 2016 is kind of the bottom of the compatibility matrix for that. 2022 um, is supported here. Now there are some changes uh, with Postgres. So if you are using Postgres in 11, um, 10.2 was still a supported version at 11.1, 11.15 is the lowest version. And then there is now support for 14.5 for the, for the Postgres. So we, each time we do these webinars, we kind of scour the functionality matrix. It is not a fun document to go, th uh, go through, but I did want to take a look between 11 and 11.1 and just see if there were any changes. Now, I, I do know that nobody here uh, checked the knowledge server. This is kind of a little bit of a more obscure extension, but if anybody's catching this later, um, labeled property graphs um, are new input data types for the knowledge server. And there wasn't a supported database for the knowledge server before, but now there's one Neo4j. And then this was kind of notable. So I did notice under the security authentication and authorization, if you look down here at the bottom, it's kind of hard to read, but we have TLS uh, 1.2. But over here, we now have TLS 1.3 and 1.2. So that, that was uh, notable to me. So something to, that you can keep in mind. This is kind of the, the big thing that I want to talk about. So there has been some changes, some quite big changes from 11.0 to 11.1 with regard to the web adapter. So um, there, there was a, a significant bug. Um, in 11.1, I've experienced it with a few of my clients. I also have a few clients that did not experience this bug at all. So what it what it was is it it was a uh, 
a kind of a failure on heavy load with the web adapters. So um, there were some changes and I probably should have put this, let's just, we can go back and forth here. So the big change that happened was that there before 11.1, there were there was a, a single application pool for your web adapters. You can see that up here, um, there's four web adapters in this deployment and they're all under this single uh, app pool. Here is in 11.1, we have the portal app pool and the server app pool and we've got you know one web adapter for each. Um, so going back there, uh, the server web adapter in, in most cases was the problem web adapter. And we'd see things like, oh, you just randomly, your data layers wouldn't load when going through the web adapter. Uh, you couldn't get to server manager, lots of performance problems. There was a web adapter reliability patch that initially came out. There was a, a community forum that was dedicated to this, lots of people facing this issue. Um, Folks applied the patch. The first patch, it did not solve the problem. Um, we got on with the web adapter team. They were able to reproduce the issue and came out with the reliability patch too. Um, that also did not work. And it, it, we found out that what was happening was that the patch wasn't actually applying to the web adapter um, despite showing that it was installed when going to installed programs and features. Um, it was showing through Windows that it was installed, but it, when we went to the web adapter DLL, we saw that there was no update to it. So they have come out with the web adapter reliability patch 2B and that, uh, so basically the, the workaround until that patch came up was to stop IIS um, essentially, or the WWW service, which essentially stops that. And then apply the patch and start it back up and that that uh, would would take effect. So that that logic has been worked into this uh, reliability patch to be and it's essential that you install that if you're going to 11.1 or if you're at 11.1 and you don't know anything about it, even if you're not, not experiencing problems, it's a good idea to go ahead and install this patch. Um, some uh, additional uh, components that need to be installed at 11.1 is the Microsoft Web Deploy 3.6 and this ASP.NET Core Runtime Hosting Bundle 6. whatever the latest version is. Um, if you enable IIS before installing this, um, oh, you need to enable IIS before installing or you're going to need to repair the bundle. Um, so uh, just install IIS first, then install this if you're doing a brand new deployment. So we just kind of went over the web adapter changes. So here's the web adapter reliability patch. I have a link to that reliability patch um, in the links at the end of this webinar. So um, after you run that, you would go to um, inetpub ww root, find your web adapter, um, go down in here to look at the esri.arcgis.webadapter.dll, and it should have a date of 8-10-2023. If it does not, then something went wrong and that didn't actually apply. So just a few of the product highlights. So webhooks are now out of beta for geoprocessing and feature services. Um, and then we just talked about the .NET 6 based web adapter. So that was a, a, quite a big change. Um, and then we have the ability to connect to ArcGIS Enterprise from ArcGIS AllSource. So we'll take a look at what's new in Portal. So this organiza organizational webhooks, uh, this is something I haven't actually been able to set up yet, but I, I really like the potential here. Um, and I'm gonna look into it because I, I think the, the ability to get notified when, when certain things happen, especially from an administration uh, perspective, is, is some great additional functionality. So we get to these by going organi organization settings, going down to webhooks. We can create a webhook here. So you would name it um, the type. So I, I decided to, in this example, just choose groups. And then you can choose a specific group or all groups. Um, and then these are the events. So here I chose group add, group delete. So I didn't have time to go in here and set this up. Um, if you have a notebook server registered with your ArcGIS Enterprise, there would be an additional option here. Right now, webhook URL is the, is the only thing that you can do. So if you had something like Power Automate, um, 
or Integra mat, you could set that up with a payload. And then basically you, when, when something happens, when the group is added or deleted, that would be sent to your webhook. Um, and then you could do something like trigger an email to let you know uh, when those events have happened. And these are just some of the items that you can do. So, you know, trigger event for all items, um, when an item has been added or deleted or updated, um, you can you can find this online um, and look at all the different uh, items that that you have the potential to have as events that are triggered. So there's a new privilege uh, to manage categories. So we kind of mentioned categories um, for for members before that was new in 11.0. So now there's this permission that you could give an individual just that that privilege if you wanted somebody else to manage that. This one is uh, one that I've actually found recently. I found it very, very helpful, especially from an admin perspective, and especially if you have um, tons of users in your enterprise. But this is for AD and LDAP. So um, you would find this um, by going onto the machine where your portal's installed into the installation here. It's in, usually in program features, ArcGIS, portal tools, and account management. And it basically will go through and it'll take a look at any Active Directory users that are no longer an Active Directory. And it'll even go uh, further and let you know like if they own items or groups so that you can remove those items or transfer those items and transfer those groups to new ownership um, and remove those uh, people from your organization. It even gives you the last login. So it gives you a nice report and then it gives you two text files, one showing um, just the users and the other one showing items or people with items that need to be removed. So, so here's some just additional functionality related to admin. So when adding members in bulk to your organization using a CSV, the process of identifying and fixing the field errors has been improved. Um, you can set the height of your cover image to two thirds of the screen when configuring the header of your organizational homepage, um, change the ownership of a report to another default admin, uh, use the output file supported by the WebGIS DR tool to review the results of the operation and swap a hosted feature layer view source uh, layer to update the data without disrupting the use of the view. In mapping and visualization. So this is kind of nice for anybody that's had the issue where, because uh, now you can manually add a category for values that don't yet exist um, in your data. So that's always been kind of an issue when, you know, you have uh, a value that hasn't been added in there yet. And now you're kind of have to wait or, or you realize that a new value was added and, and somebody can't see it, it's not being displayed because now you have to go back in after the fact to, uh, to, to display that category. So that's a, a nice added feature. Um, can use pie charts to visualize data in tables and layers in the map viewer. Can use multi-layer and complex polygon symbols, including hatch fills made from marker symbols to style the layer or create a sketch layer. Um, you can configure pattern properties for the hatch fill is, um, symbols and such as specifying the rotation of the hatch fill pattern. So just a couple things in data management. So now you can add a GeoJSON file from the web as an item in your organization or publish a hosted feature layer from a GeoJSON file, um, providing the URL to access the file. And then this refresh snapshots from Cloud Data Warehouse. So I'm not sure if anybody's uh, using any Cloud Data Warehouses, but essentially if you publish a map image layer or feature layer from a Cloud Data Warehouse in ArcGIS Pro, the, the data that's returned by that career layer to the map is copied to the uh, relational data store. And so the web layer references the data in the relational data store, which essentially can perform better than going up to the cloud to query the data warehouse. And so now if, now if that source data changes, you can easily refresh the snapshot of the data from the layer, uh, the layers page and portal. So for sharing and collaboration, there's two new privileges. So you can share member content with the organization and share member content with the public. So those are just two additional capabilities that you can really um, create that, that custom, those custom uh, privileges and custom roles for people. And there is now support for sharing experience builder apps and templates. So only the sending party can edit. 
um, and the collaboration can edit, uh, utility resources that are included in the app are updated in the corresponding utility service in the recipients portal. So that would be something like the print widget. So if there was a print widget uh, configured to the sending organization's utility and you shared that through a collaboration, that print widget will now use your uh, print, print tool. And there are certain widgets that cannot be shared. So that's the branch version management, oriented imagery catalog, the survey one, two, three, and the utility network trace. So a few things that are new in dashboards. So that list search, which is nice. So that uh, will allow um, a search window to pop up at the top of your list and you can search your list items. The data download button now um, for data-driven uh, widgets in the dashboard. And there is a dashboard reset for people that are interacting with the dashboard that can reset it back to the original view. some things in field maps. So you can now set up geofences to alert mobile workers um, or automatically enable location sharing when they enter or exit a geofence. Um, control which features are used as geofences by adding filters. Um, we can add layer filters to filter features on the map. Um, re reference a tile package from your organization to use as the offline base map. We can now view contingent field groups configured in ArcGIS Pro and then add them to the form. Uh, we can control whether field values are preserved when they become hidden on the form and view nested group layers on the forms page. So there are a number of solutions that are new at 11.1. So we've got, here's a few 3D buildings, adopt a highway, adopt a tree, a bridge inventory, a combined sewer data management, communication service availability, geonames locator, irrigation system data management, parks and grounds, railroad crossings, um, tax parcel data management, and water utility service interruptions. And there are a few things that are new in story maps. So slideshow has been upgraded to a sidecar layout and inherits features such as map actions, inline and background audio, flexible content arrangements in the narrative panel and more. Film strip layout is now available for image gallery. The story builder's full page publishing screen improves visibility of important options. Some publishing workflow includes the option to disable updates to a story's ArcGIS item details. There's a contrast checker. It helps improve accessibility when choosing colors in Story Builder. Um, image editing enables you to crop and add markups to images. Now this is in beta only right now. Add a consent message that displays to readers for stories that use Google Analytics and readers can copy and share links that point directly to a story heading. Experience Builder, these are just a few new widgets that are available. Um, there is a document, I probably should have linked this at the links. There's, there's a document out there. I mean, I'm sure as most of you know by now, uh, Web App Builder is going away and Experience Builder is now the future. But for those of you at 1091, you're missing some vital functionality to be able to move your, your apps over there, including the search widget, the edit widget and the print widget. Those are ones, those are widgets I typically see in Web App Builder. So if you're at 1091 right now, it's gonna be a little difficult probably for you to move your, your workflows over to Experience Builder. Um, but there is a migration matrix um, out there that will show you like when, what version, the widgets uh, planned for, uh, and even which ones that are currently not planned to have moved over. Um, so right here, we got 3D toolbox, coordinates, grid, print widget. That one actually, yep, I can't remember if that one, that one might've popped up in 11.0. Um, timeline widget, utility network trace. Um, there, that was in beta at 10.91, and then it wasn't in 11.1, and now it's back out uh, full support in 11.1. Branch version management widget and the coordinate conversion widget. So just quickly, um, identify depreciated items. 
So if we take a look at that, you're going to have the link to see uh, the Python script right here. You can just download the Python script and run that in your environment. It'll note, it'll let you know what you need to modify. We have our web adapter reliability patch 2B. It'll give you uh, a, a little bit more information on exactly what bugs it addresses. Um, and you can download the patch here. And then some documentation on ident identifying those inactive domain accounts. So um, it'll give you, there's some, there's some uh, parameters that you'll need to, to throw in there, um, but it gives you a couple examples of how you can run that and, and print out that report. 